On April 22, 1977, Top Gear premiered on the British Broadcasting Corporation's BBC Two channel. The basic premise of the show was to discuss any relevant topics when it came to the world of British motoring. These would typically include car reviews, showcases of many kinds of vehicles, and tips on how to save money when buying them. In its beginning, the original presenters of Top Gear were Tom Coyne and Angela Rippon, both of whom presented the show in a very informational format, in a way that wasn't too far off from your typical journalist on the morning news. Well, I don't claim to be an expert driver, or even a particularly good one, but I do spend an awful lot of my time driving, and I do cover an awful lot of miles. To give you some idea, I've had this car since new, from January the 2nd, where now about halfway through April, and I've already got just under 12,000 miles on the clock, so I'll give you some idea of the sort of mileage that I do. As it went on, Top Gear proved to be a very popular program, and while viewing figures did begin to decline after a certain point, the show still managed to remain on air for an impressive 24 years, concluding its broadcast on December 17, 2001. Over the course of its run, Top Gear would cycle through several different presenters, the 1980s being the decade when several of the more notable would appear on the program, including Noel Edmonds, Tiff Needle, Andy Willman, and Jeremy Clarkson. With each presenter that appeared, they would give their own little influence on the show, altering its presentation in small ways while still keeping it a car and motoring focused program. Now, trying to find footage of the old Top Gear is actually a bit harder of a task than I expected when I first began researching its original run. The thing about the show is that it wasn't really designed to be re-watched. It presented information on cars that wouldn't really be relevant if you watched it in the modern day. And since the show didn't really have any use outside of its specific time period, neither the BBC or anyone else really, really thought the show was worth archiving in any form. Because of this, it's very difficult to find full episodes of the old Top Gear anywhere on the internet, and while there do exist old VHS releases of some select episodes, much of the original show has straight up become lost media. If the story of Top Gear ended here, then there wouldn't be much else to talk about. It would just be another show that's faded into the folds of television history. But the thing is, the story didn't end when the show concluded its run. If you say the words Top Gear to anyone nowadays, chances are that they wouldn't immediately think of the original 1977 program. No, they would be more likely to think of something that looks a lot more like this. Hammond, you idiot! You reversed into the sports lorry! Clarkson! Oh, God. Um... For God's sake! Mind Robin. Oh no. On October 20th, 2002, Top Gear was relaunched under a new look with new presenters and a new feel. The relaunch started off with a 10 episode first season, with new seasons still in production to this day. While it's no longer as popular as it used to be, Top Gear remains as one of the most significant shows ever made, even being listed in the Guinness World Records as the most widely watched factual TV program at a point. And the show itself is one that I find super interesting, mainly because of how it evolved over time, which itself came from the community that surrounded it. Combine that with certain other factors we'll get into, and they ended up creating a very special type of show. And it's just something I feel like talking about today, because the journey of Top Gear is something truly fascinating to me at least. So let me tell you the story of Jezza, Hamster, and Captain Slow as we try to figure out what exactly it was that Top Gear really ended up meaning. Now it's important to note that when Top Gear was relaunched in 2002, the format of the show was largely the same as the original program. The show was hosted by returning presenter Jeremy Clarkson, joined by fellow co-presenters Richard Hammond and Jason Daw. All three of these presenters had had some kind of experience with cars or the motoring industry prior to them being employed for Top Gear, Jeremy Clarkson in particular having been one of the more popular hosts for the previous version of the show. At this point, much of the show is catered towards specific audiences, those being the common consumer or just general motoring enthusiast, with most segments involving reviews of then-current cars and giving consumer advice on how best to buy them. For instance, one of these segments in this early point in the show was a bit presented by Jason Daw, where he gave advice on used cars and the kind of bargains one could make when trying to purchase them. But despite having a style very similar to the original, the revamped Top Gear did introduce a few new elements and segments. As an example, a good majority of episodes featured a segment 
segment called A Star in a Reasonably Priced Car, where they would get some kind of celebrity on the show, interview them for a few minutes, and then see how fast they could do a lap on the show's testing track. But probably the most notable of the new additions was The Stig, an anonymous racing driver who tested out cars on the Top Gear testing track. The entire joke with this character being that nobody actually knew who was inside the suit, giving him a very mysterious quality, and so every time he was introduced in an episode, it was typically done by jokingly revealing supposed rumors about him. Some say that he invented the curtain, <laughs> and that he recently submitted a £20,000 expenses claim for some gravel for his moat. When it comes to the first season of the show, there actually isn't that much to talk about, as it really just is a modified version of the original Top Gear, and because of that, if you're not really into car news from 2002, then there's not much of a reason to go back and watch it. The presenters themselves, I think, are actually the worst part of the first season. They're good at being presenters, don't get me wrong, but it's clear that they hadn't quite gotten used to each other yet, so the segments where they're talking about car news kind of carries the same energy of, like, a group class project where none of the people in the group know each other, but like they're still trying to act friendly, you know what I mean? Season 2 would see the first major change to the show, as Jason Daw would leave the program to be replaced by another co-host. And this is how the show introduced him. One day, probably in the dentist, you'll find yourself leaping idly through the small ads in the back of a classic car magazine. And you'll probably think to yourself, huh, all that money I spent on a Ford Mondeo could have been used to buy something really interesting, like Mark II Inspector Moore style Jag, for example, an old Porsche 911. There are quite a few old Porsche 911s in here. Look, you could even have a Bentley. This is James May. Now, he had actually already had experience with Top Gear, having been a presenter for the original show despite only making appearances in its 41st season. With Dawes' departure, though, James May was convinced to take his place, and was, in the opinion of pretty much everyone, the absolute perfect replacement. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop you. I hate to interrupt, but this is quite honestly the biggest load of limp-wristed twaddle I've ever heard in all my five weeks in television. <laughs> These two... <laughs> These two are not men, okay? This one, Richard Hammond, every morning sticks his head in a bucket of hair products. Right? <laughs> He's got a dog, but it's a poodle. And I don't know what you're laughing about, Clarkson, because you won't drink brown beer. And this is the man that says flatulence, oh, it's not funny, when clearly it is. <laughs> Even in modern day, when most people think of Top Gear, chances are that the first thing they think of are these three individuals. And there's a very good reason for this. The combination of Clarkson, Hammond, and May was an absolutely perfect team-up, as each presenter had their own unique perspectives and personalities that perfectly bounced off of each other and created a great dynamic that simply didn't exist in the first season. And I think it's because of this dynamic in particular that the show began to go through slow changes in its presentation. Like I've been saying, early on the revival was mostly the same as the original program, but as the seasons continued and as the show became more popular, the audience it targeted began to subtly shift. It became less of a show directly focused on car advice, and more of a show focused on doing interesting stuff with cars. It's less about the information, and more about the entertainment. The shift into this general car-focused approach can be seen with the introduction of challenge segments, where in each one the presenters would be given some kind of task to complete involving cars. These segments usually bookended each episode and would take up a large portion of the runtime. Towards the beginning, they start out rather simple. For instance, in Season 7, Episode 4, Clarkson, Hammond, and May are each given the task of buying a $10,000 Italian supercar, which would then be put through a series of challenges to see which one would be the most efficient. It's a basic idea, and you can still see how this keeps the original premise of consumer advice, just with this bit being specifically about Italian supercars. At a point, though, the challenges completely stop being about the consumer and are instead based around whatever wacky situation the producers of the show could come up with. In Season 8, Episode 7, for example, the trio are tasked with building a kit car from scratch, competing with the stick to finish it before he's able to race across the UK. 3 8 internal diameter, half an inch outside this, diameter, 35 millimeter. From the rear mount using bolts 3, inserted from the front of the mounting. James, does it need a washer, yes or no? The three somehow actually managed to win this challenge, but only because the Stig ends up getting arrested for speeding. 
One of the more well-known of these challenges comes from Season 15, Episode 4, where Clarkson, Hammond, and May set out to revolutionize the world of camping by each making their own unique camper vans, all three of which come with their own set of issues that make camping quite unpleasant. Jeremy, for instance, developing this very wobbly car tower. And the reason I bring this one up is only because I want to highlight how this episode has one of the funniest moments in the entire series. Now, this isn't to say that the show had completely divorced itself from its original reason for existing, as every episode would still spend time with a review of whatever recent cars were out at the time, amongst other segments that were very specifically focused on the motoring industry. Top Gear was still inherently a car show, it's just that the presentation of how the cars were discussed changed by quite a bit. And it's weird, because even the car review segments experienced a few changes with this gradual shift in direction, the two most obvious examples of this being the segments on the PLP-50 and the Reliant Robin. Rather than just being standard reviews with basic cars, these segments were more focused on demonstrating these more unique vehicles with their own quirks and more, well, let's just say less serious situations. No, not again! Oh no... These are the kind of segments that really resonated with general audiences, the kind that got the show's appeal to grow beyond being only for the type of people who care mostly about the car stuff. But out of every segment that Top Gear is known for, the most popular, without a doubt, are the specials. Every couple of seasons, one or two episodes would be dedicated entirely to some kind of special challenge, where the presenters would travel to some part of the world and have to complete some car-specific task. The reason the specials in particular are the most well-regarded episodes of the show is because I think they're the perfect combination of all the good things that this show had, as well as what drew so many people to it. Despite still being a big part of these specials, there wasn't as much of a focus on the cars, meaning the entertainment value had to come mostly from the dynamic between Clarkson, Hammond, and May, as well as the interesting places that they actually visited. So real quick, let's just take a look at a few of the more significant episodes. One of the first specials that the show ever did was in Season 9, Episode 3, with the USA special. In the episode, the three are dropped in the middle of Miami, Florida, and are each tasked with buying a car for less than $1,000, something that ends up being far more difficult than they initially expected. Okay, how much is it? $64,815. So, $64,815. $1,000? Yeah. What if I gave you... One thousand dollars for it. One thousand. Mm. Once they actually do find vehicles, they're challenged with driving all the way to New Orleans in three cars that barely function. Along the way, they get into many wacky shenanigans, one of the more infamous being when they enter Alabama, paint offensive phrases on each other's cars, and then nearly get assaulted by a group of angry rednecks. Well done, America. Season 12, Episode 8 was the Vietnam Special, where the three are given the challenge of driving through the country of Vietnam completely on motorbikes, something Jeremy is not very happy about. The reason I bring this episode up is because it's regarded as one of Top Gear's best episodes in its entirety. It's one of the highest rated on IMDb, at least. The other reason I bring this one up is because of the backup vehicle for this journey. So in almost every special, the group are given a backup vehicle to use just in case one of theirs breaks down or it just can't be used for whatever reason. Usually the backup is something that none of them would want to drive in any circumstance. And for the Vietnam special, it's... Ooh. Oh my god. Oh, ho. Oh. Oh, yes, that is a bit... Oh, God, I don't think so. It's slightly conspicuous. Evidently... That's thunder and the village. <laughs> Have you noticed there was a rumble of thunder and the village arrived? I... Children, if you're watching this at home and you don't know why this is inappropriate, ask your parents. Season 10, Episode 4 was the Botswana episode. In the episode, each presenter finds a two-wheel drive car for less than 1,500 pounds, which they then must drive across the country of Botswana. I bring this one up almost exclusively because of the car that Richard Hammond chooses for this journey. The car he goes with is a 1963 Opel Cadet, and despite both Clarkson and May making fun of the car, Hammond ends up becoming quite attached to it. This is just the happiest car in the world. I should call it Oliver. Not that we'd ever name a car on top, I wish I hadn't said that. 
Oliver is actually a bit of a fan favorite within the Top Gear community, and as far as I'm aware, it's one of the few cars from Top Gear specifically that the presenters still own. Seriously, Richard Hammond still owns this car and maintains it to this day. That's so wholesome. And speaking of important Top Gear cars, I'd be remiss to not mention Season 14 Episode 1 with the Romanian Road Trip. Okay, so this one requires a bit of context. For a couple seasons prior to this episode, there was this running gag where James in particular would get very excited about an upcoming car at the time, the Dacia Sandero, which the other two didn't really seem to share much enthusiasm for. Great news. What? The Dacia Sandero is almost here. When? Next year. Great. Now, the Toyota Urban Cruiser... <laughs> The payoff for this joke comes in during the presenter's drive through Romania, where Jeremy buys James a second-hand Dacia Sandero, which is an unnaturally kind thing for him to do. James drives it around for a bit, looking pretty happy with his surprise present until... No! Stop! Stop! My car's part of Not that! What? It's up for You're supposed you. to look... Look! Mirrors! Oh, 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 oh. oh, well. You used it for work and everything, wouldn't you? Why don't you go away? It would have been your everyday car. It would have made you happier. There is an old tradition in this country that on the third Wednesday of every month, which is what today is, people with a black t shirt on and a picture of a stupid Russian spark plug shut up. Quick aside, I've watched this clip plenty of times, and I still can't seem to figure out if this bit was scripted or not. Like, I kinda hope it wasn't, only because if it was scripted, this whole bit would feel a little mean-spirited, you know? I think if I had to choose only a few episodes to demonstrate the appeal of this version of Top Gear, the specials are probably the ones I'd pick out, because each one really is a perfect demonstration of why so many people came to enjoy this show. And it's so weird because you have to remember that this was a show that discussed cars, and they still did plenty of that. There was plenty of car talk. The core of the show was always about motoring. But at a point, the selling point became less about the discussion of the cars and more about the people who were discussing the cars. These three presenters and their dynamic became the backbone of the show, and I believe that is, to some degree, why the show became as popular as it did. And yes, Top Gear did gain quite a bit of attention. As I mentioned earlier, it at one point was the most watched factual TV program ever. And if you want a good visual indicator of the show's popularity, just take a look at the crowds in the background of the studio. For the first few seasons, you can see that the background of the studio is sparsely filled with small groups of people. They're crowded around cars and all, but there's still plenty of room to walk around in open floor space. And hell, in some shots, they aren't even paying attention to the presenters talking. Cut to later seasons like 10, 11, and so forth, and you can see that the studio is filled to the brim with people who wanted to be there live and in person. By the way, I did a little research to see how you could have gotten onto the show, and apparently according to this one article, there's a 21 year long wait list to get tickets for a studio recording. I don't know how true that is, especially given the current state of the show, but if it is, then just... wow. Now it's kind of impossible to do a Top Gear retrospective like this without bringing up the myriad of controversies that this show has been embroiled in, and they're important to talk about within the grand scheme of things because it would be these specific controversies that would shape the future of the program. Now a show that goes on for as long as Top Gear is of course going to have its fair share of unfavorable moments, and this show is no exception. I mean, just take a look at the Wikipedia page about Top Gear controversies. This thing is long. Now a lot of this is really minor stuff in retrospect, you know, mostly just cracking jokes about other countries, making fun of them, that sort of thing. The US, it feels, is one country that they target a lot. If you're thinking of coming to America, this is what it's like. You've got your comfort in, you've got your best western, you've got your red lobster where you eat. Everybody's very fat, everybody's very stupid, and everybody's very rude. It's not the holiday program, it's the truth. But even besides that, there are some moments, some jokes in the show that are made that, while I don't think they're like super offensive or anything, do kind of sound like the presenters were trying to get a reaction out of someone, like that was the point of the joke. And when it comes to these kind of moments, out of the three, it usually ends up being Jeremy Clarkson who initiates them. Like I enjoy watching Clarkson, he has a fun personality that makes him a great presenter, but let's be real here, the man has a tendency to say some pretty out there things. Jeremy, didn't you recently call bus drivers Nazis? No. No, you did, you did. You you I didn't. You did. I didn't. I said that they were little Hitlers and murderers. 
Now, the people behind Top Gear never really seem to get bogged down by the criticism flung at them for these offensive moments, despite how big said criticism could get at some points, and the presenters themselves were willing to make fun of themselves for these controversies. For instance, towards the end of the Burma special, there's this one moment where Clarkson and Hammond are standing on a bridge, and Jeremy says, That is a proud moment, but there's a slope on it. Yeah, right. It's definitely higher on that side. The word slope in this context is actually a derogatory term for people of Asian descent. It's just a stupid joke, and of course certain people took offense to it, and the producers apologized, and that was really the end of it, with the show referencing the incident a couple times afterwards. That is a proud moment, um, Hammond, but is it straight? Yes. Yes. Now, when it comes to most of the controversial incidents in this show's run, they usually followed the same pattern. Someone on the show makes some kind of comment or joke that some group finds offensive, the producers apologize, and everybody moves on. And it's interesting to take note of this because the way the show ended was the moment that this pattern stopped being the case. What do I mean by this? Well, let me explain. To summarize the situation as best as I can, on March 4th, 2015, during the production of season 22, Jeremy Clarkson physically assaulted an assistant producer on the show, Oisin Timmon. The reason for the assault apparently being due to his irritation at the lack of hot food at the hotel the crew were staying at. This little incident eventually reached the BBC, where Clarkson was suspended from Top Gear, and 15 days later, the company decided not to renew his contract, effectively ending his time on the program. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this part because it's not really the point of this video, but in doing my research, while I don't condone his actions, it kind of makes sense when you look at the bigger picture. I say this because this was a point in time where Clarkson's life was kind of falling apart. His mother had died the previous year, he was going through a divorce with his wife at the time, he was apparently found to be at risk for tongue cancer just a few days prior, so yeah, the man was definitely being put through the ringer here, and I guess he had just hit the breaking point by then. But back on topic here, the reason this part of Top Gear's history is so significant is because of what happened to the show itself. You see, just because Clarkson was booted from the show, it didn't mean that the show itself had to stop completely. James May and Richard Hammond could still do the show, just with a different co-host. However, that's not what ended up happening, as when Clarkson was kicked from Top Gear, both Hammond and May, as well as the show's producer Andy Willman, voluntarily quit the show as well. And that's what I find so wholesome about this whole thing. These two were not in danger of losing their jobs at all. They were fine, but they still made the choice to actively leave the show because of the bond they had formed. To them, it just wouldn't work without all three of them. And luckily, this didn't spell the end of the trio, as only a year later, the Grand Tour was announced for Amazon Prime, a spiritual successor of sorts to the three's version of Top Gear. And I mean that in the sense that the Grand Tour is literally Top Gear in everything but name. Now, while I think the way they left Top Gear could have certainly been better, in the long run, I think it was actually very beneficial for them, as being paired up with Amazon Prime has kind of given them a new freedom to do different kind of shows that they probably wouldn't have been able to do with the BBC. You've still got the Grand Tour, of course, and the show is currently in its fifth season, but by this point, they're only doing occasional special episodes. They're great, don't get me wrong, but it's becoming clear that the show is probably going to be wrapping up in the next couple of years, but that still leaves all the individual projects the presenters have done in the meantime, most of which have been pretty successful. James May, for one, has been doing a travel show, basically, where he goes to different parts of the world and gets really in-depth about their culture. Jeremy Clarkson has been most prominent in the Clarkson's Farm series, which is kind of like this pseudo documentary about him trying to manage this massive farm he owns and real talk here if you haven't seen this show please check it out if you can it's actually really good and as for richard hammond he did whatever this was supposed to be yeah he started this show with one of the guys from mythbusters where he's stuck on a deserted island but like it's all scripted and kind of weird and i don't really know what the point of this was the point is, these three have been fairly successful since leaving Top Gear, and much of that success comes from their audience. Like I said, the selling point for Top Gear eventually morphed into being more about the presenters than the cars, so when they left, many people didn't really see the point in continuing to tune into the show. And that's what, to me, Top Gear was truly about. It wasn't the vehicles, it wasn't the car politics, it was about Jeremy Clarkson, James May, and Richard Hammond, the three that made the show what it was. And I'm confident in saying this, especially given what Top Gear has become in the modern day. 
I know I've been phrasing it like the show ended once the presenters quit, but that's not actually the case. The show is still on the air. It's been going since Clarkson and the others left, but it's clear that it just doesn't resonate with as many people as it used to. It apparently really struggled to find some good new presenters in its first year or so. Again, it's still being produced. Its ratings are fine, but the magic is gone. It's kind of just turned back into what it used to be, just a car show. Top Gear and The Grand Tour were and continue to both be very unique shows and that they appealed to such a special type of audience and because of how it influenced the lives of those who were associated with it. It's very likely that without this program, neither Jeremy Clarkson, James May, or Richard Hammond would be nearly as successful as they are today, and it's hard to imagine how long Top Gear would have gone on for had this specific trio of presenters not been on the show, or if they hadn't worked out as well as they did. And furthermore, it's doubly interesting to see how their individual careers have evolved, going from a small car show, turning it into one of TV's biggest programs, and then branching off into their own individual shows, some of which proved to be nearly as successful. I can't understate how influential these three are. Are. They have very much earned the fan base that they have, and I for one am very much looking forward to whatever they decide to do next. James, well, you've got a theory on that. Well, I've got a question actually for the listeners, which is if you use a jet wash, should the bonger on each cycle go off at the end of the cycle or in the middle? I think it should go off in the middle, because it's then you know whether to speed up or slow down. See, I have no idea what? what you're talking about. I know you haven't. Do you see that thinking about that a lot? Yeah, that, well, I think it is important. They all go off at the end, but if the bonger goes off at the end of the foamy brush cycle and you've only done the bonnet, you've had it. 